This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy and I am delighted to welcome an independent investigative journalist focused on bringing credible information about hidden, paranormal and impossible realities into the mainstream. She is the author of the award-winning book Surviving Death, A Journalist Investigates Evidence for an Afterlife, which was also turned into a six-part Netflix series and the book UFOs, Generals, Pilots and Government Officials Go on the Record. She's also a speaker at the upcoming An Inquiry into Anomalous Experiences and the Phenomenon Conference being hosted in New York City. More to come on that later. Without any further delay or introduction, allow me to welcome Leslie Kane to the podcast. Hi, Andy. So good to be with you. Good to have you. And I'm glad I got through that. That's why I asked for 90 minutes just to get through that introduction. So... You know what? I don't know if you heard me laugh, but when you said the surviving death, it sounded like you said turned into a sex pot. (laughs) That's what I heard because you said six part, but it sounded like sex pot. I don't know why it's probably got to do with your accent. So that's why I I laughed. I hope I didn't interrupt, but I couldn't. No, people, people will love that. The accent's a regular topic of conversation on the podcast. And we were just talking about that before we hit record. Um, It might be a sex pot for some people. Maybe that's their thing, you know, but hey, Netflix has got all kinds on there for all kinds. So listen, let's get straight into it, Leslie. Uh, First off, I like to ask my guests how they first got involved or had an interest in the UFO subject. How far back does your your interest in UFOs go? It goes back to 1999, actually. Um, And it all started when I was working at a public radio station in California on the West Coast of the United States. Um, And I was working as a producer and a host of a daily investigative news program. And a colleague from France sent me in the mail this 90 page study called the Cometa report, which probably a lot of your listeners are familiar with, but um, it was, it was 90 pages of analysis of you official UFO cases, you know, really good cases with a lot of data pilots and mainly pilot cases, military cases. And this very distinguished group wrote it, which included generals and admirals and police of chief, uh, chief police and former space experts. And a lot, they were all retired and they were part of a think tank in France and anyway, they, they analyzed all these cases. And what really struck me as a reporter was they drew the conclusion that the best explanation for what they, for the cases they studied was the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And they kind of, it was just written right out in black and white, very methodically, you know, well, this is kind of the only, this is the, our best conclusion where we can't prove it, but um, it seems the most likely explanation. And I just thought, you know, if even one of these cases was that, it would be a major story. So I was very struck by this report. It was like 90 pages and very authoritative. And because of who the authors were, you know, I it, I knew that I could maybe do something with this as a reporter because of this, this you know, who the authors were. And so um, that's how I first got into it. What I did with that report was I ended up pitching a story to the Boston Globe, which is a a major paper in Boston, Massachusetts. It's actually owned by the New York Times. And um, it's because I had written stories for the Boston Globe prior to this. And so I knew the editor of the Sunday section quite well, and she really liked my work. Of course, I'd written about other topics, not about UFOs. And so she was willing to take this on, but it was such a different world than Andy. I mean, it was so hard to get that story in the Boston Globe. And, and a lot of the editors I went to at other papers who I who knew me, because I was a freelance writer then. So I, in those days, you could just sort of submit stories to a lot of newspapers. It wasn't like it is today. And um, they all liked me, but most of them wouldn't touch this. And I would even try to not say the word UFO when I pitched the story to them on the phone, you know? Yeah. It was just like there were, the stigma was so intense. And this, 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 um, Editor for the Sunday Globe, uh, Sunday Review section, you know, was really at one point she just she said, we're not doing it. You know, she and then I went back to her and I said, well, look, why don't we change this and let's change this. And it was heavily edited, you know, all of that. But she finally came out with that story and it was a long piece. It was like more than half of a full page on the, you know, on the in the section. So 
Um, and it wasn't just about that report, but I also did some research into American national security issues and stuff like that around UFOs. So that's what really got me started. I mean, the, the response to that story from the UFO community was just so ecstatic because I, you know, no, no one in the mainstream writes about this in mainstream newspapers. No one mm. had at that time. I mean, there were some reporters doing it, doing more good work in their local areas. Like, of course, George Knapp had been doing this forever, but he was based in Los Angeles and Las Vegas. I mean, you know, and he worked for the TV network there and did great work. But this was like a, a mainstream newspaper and, and the story went out on the wire. So it was picked up in other papers across the country. So anyway, everybody in the UFO community was very happy about it. And that was, there was no turning back for me at that point. I was so, you know, inspired to learn more about this topic. And I was kind of amazed at how strong the taboo was. And I wanted to kind of understand what that was about. And so I basically ended up eventually leaving the radio station and just devoting myself to this full time. But so it's been, it's that my first story came out in May of 2000. So it's been 22 years really since I've been writing and publishing on UFOs. It sounds to me like you had to have a lot of credit in the bank just to get the editor to to get that story published eventually. And I wonder, was it the case they tried to almost convince you out of putting that sort of subject out there with the stigma and taboo? And and given that that positive reaction, was there no appetite for a follow up from the Boston Globe, for example, to say, look, we got a great reaction from this. Let's do more. Well, um, so the first question was, um, were they trying to get me not to do it? I mean, all they could do is just say, no, we don't want your story. There's, you know, and everybody else except the Globe did that because I, I called a bunch of people um, and she didn't, you know, she was just very nervous, you know, because it was considered like a tabloid subject then, you know. So a follow up I did. I, my next story was I came out a year later and it was about pilot cases that affected aviation safety. And I did go back to the Boston Globe at that point, but it turns out that editor had left the paper. So between my first and second story, she had left the paper. So unfortunately the editor, the people there, the woman who was there, I forget who replaced her, but they weren't interested in this. Unfortunately, I wish she hadn't left, but I, but the second story went into the Providence, Providence journal, which is Providence, Rhode Island. It's a very small state, but that this story went, all over the place on the wires. I mean, it got a lot more play than the first one did. And it was about um, a, a report that had come out of the organization called NARCAP, which studies aviation safety cases written by Richard Haynes, a former NASA senior scientist, um, and all about these cases that impacted aviation safety. So I jumped off of that report and did some research into cases that, you know, that affected aviation safety, both for commercial pilots and military pilots. And I thought, you know, this is a this is a reason that the status quo can care about this. You know, it's not it, it's like there's a reason to be concerned because this affects aviation safety. And it was a good hook in that way. So at, at what point did you start putting together the idea for the book in, for 2010? Obviously, that's UFOs, generals, pilots and government officials go on the record, which already sounds a lot like the report you mentioned that got your initial interest. Was that where the idea for the book was seeded or did that come later? Um, wait, now, which report did you mean? Oh, the Cometa report? Yes. Yeah. No, the, well, the title of that was UFOs and Defense. What are we prepared for? It was very much focused on national security concerns, that that initial report from France. It was very much like these things are out there. So what are we going to do about it? We've got to inform our pilots. You know, we've got to take them mm -hmm. seriously. But um, so that but so my st that second story was really it was quite different. So anyway, my book, my book title was quite different. But the way I got to the book was I kept reporting on UFOs. The book came out 10 years after I started. So during those 10 years, I did a whole series of articles. Um, I did press conferences. I filed a lawsuit against NASA, which was successful. It took years and years and years about one other case. Um, and I also started working with John Podesta. I mean, I didn't really work with him, but he was, he was an influential part of the administration who was very supportive of my work. And, um, you know, just dug into a lot of cases, got to know people, kept reporting. And then in 2007, um, I teamed up with James Fox, the filmmaker, who now has the movie out called Moment of Contact, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, 
And we organized a press conference in Washington in 2007, in which we invited about, I don't know, maybe 13, something like that, um, people from all over the world uh, to come and testify at this, or, you know, give statements at this press conference in Washington. And um, they were from ma many countries, I forget how many, maybe eight different countries or something like that. And a lot of them were military pilots and investigators that had worked for governments and you know, people that had experienced this directly. But, and so it was at that press conference, I was so impressed with these people and I got to meet a lot of these uh, people from other countries who only got to give statements for five minutes at this press conference. And I thought, you know, they have so much more to offer than a five minute statement. So I thought it would be really great to, to do a book in which I could invite them to contribute basically. So then I started working on the book and it really, it, it involved chapters actually written by these people. I mean, I'd say about half the book is written by other people, not by me. So I thought, you know, rather than have the Iranian general Parviz Jafari, right, rather than me interview him about what was it like to try and shoot down this UFO over Iran, I had him just tell the whole story in his own words as, you know, so you get to hear directly from them in a whole chapter. And, and I, I worked with them all in various ways, depending on their needs for my, you know, assistance and stuff. But yeah, so then I, I thought yeah, that's what really inspired the book. I think that was your question. And then yeah. I, I really think one of the reasons it was so successful was because of the power of those chapters written by these incredibly high level, highly credentialed people that I don't think anybody was really going to question them. You know, there's also the former governor of Arizona wrote it, wrote him something for my book about the Phoenix lights case. And also John Podesta wrote the forward to the book. And so that was what, you know, so anyway, it was, um, yeah, it was really, really a powerful moment. And I think, I think that even though I'd worked 10 years in the media to try to crack the taboo, I think, it really wasn't that successful until the book came out and then there was a little bit of a crack because it got a lot of attention. Um, so, but nothing like 2017. I said, there's sort of pre 2017 and yeah. post, you know? So of all the things I did pre 2017, I would say my book was the thing that made the most impact and, you know, had the most, if anything changed, that book did it more than anything else. Yeah. And, and we're certainly going to get to 2017, but I just want to ask, was there any part of you in 2010 writing that book, putting it together, putting it out, seeing the reaction that you could have foreseen the landscape changing to what it would become post-2017? That's a great question. I mean, I certainly was hoping and asking for it to change. I, I don't know. I don't remember if I ever thought it I didn't really didn't know if it ever would. I thought probably thought it was less likely than likely. But what's interesting is I, I made, you know, the, my book back then, it was so basic. And now, now it just seems primitive. You know, I was just really making the point, number one, that UFOs are physically real, right? That they're real objects. And number two, that they need to be investigated by the scientific community and number three, they need to invest investigated by the U.S. government because they impact national security and aviation safety. And all three of those things have, there might have been one more point I made, I don't remember, but the things I was advocating, oh, and so I, you know, basically I was saying there needs to be a government agency set up to do this, right? And I was sort of advocating for that throughout the book, and so were some of my writers. And then it's turned out now, you know, so this was like you know 12 years later or even earlier that everything i asked for in that book has come to pass that's what's so amazing to me that you know the government has acknowledged that ufos are real they are physical objects it's been acknowledged many times over and that they've, they there is an agency which we discovered and they've now set up another task force and you know the scientists are coming on board to study it and government officials are studying it and the congress is into it and everything so I really, it, it's everything I hoped for in writing the book has come to pass, but whether I thought it actually would or not, I, I probably really didn't necessarily expect it would, you know, there was nothing to indicate at the time that there was any interest. And the irony is that 2007, when we gave this press conference that led to my book was the same year that the program, the precursor program to ATIP was, was being set up at the DIA, of course, totally in secret. 
Yeah. Um, just before again we get to 2017, I wonder, would you have any plans to release a second edition or sequel to that initial book, given I'm sure your contacts book and sources have increased several fold since then? I don't have such a plan. Uh, I just don't. I mean, the, the book sort of stands as a, as a book. And I think people still benefit from it now who mm. don't know much about the topic. But I think... Um, if I ever wrote another book, it'd probably be a completely different book, you know, but I, I don't have any plans at this moment to write another book. Well, but. your next, your next, like you say, milestone, uh, 2017, you wrote an article with Ralph Blumenthal and Helene Cooper, who uh, Helene often gets left off of the, the acknowledgements by people, I think, because she's never really came out in a public way. Uh, I suppose yourself and Ralph have put yourself out there a little bit more for people like myself to speak to, which is appreciated, but I could understand why anyone wouldn't do that, given the landscape and, and some of the, the conversations that go on. But that that article truly changed the UFO conversation. That That's not an exaggeration. Did you think at the time writing that article, either individually or as a trio, that this is going to have a huge impact? And, and what was the expectation? I mean, I thought it would have a huge impact. I don't think, I don't know if Helene, Helene knew about how, how intense, she didn't necessarily, she was surprised by the intensity of the response. Let's put it that way. She, she knew it was an interesting story and she wanted to do it, you know, mm -hmm. and she's the one that really made it possible for us to do it. It's the irony of the fact that, you know, that she was sort of in the background because She's not like into UFOs, right? She's yeah. just a, a Pentagon correspondent for the New York Times who got who worked on this one story and then she went about her business doing covering everything else that she normally covers. I mean, she's an outstanding reporter who's on the front page of the Times all the time covering, you know, Ukraine and Iraq and Iran and all kinds of issues. Um, and, you know, things at the Pentagon. Um She's just an amazing reporter. So it was kind of different for her because Ralph and I had both had this history with the topic and she hadn't had that history. She didn't really know what to expect, but I, um, I really thought it was going to be a big deal. Uh, I really did. Um, just knowing, having been involved for so long and seeing what a leap this was and having Lou Elizondo on the record and having Harry Reid on the record, you know, made all the difference. I just want to say to everybody, since you brought up Helene Cooper, there's going to be a little special something at the conference on December 3rd, which we can talk about later, but to, it's going to be a special little something that I'm going to offer as a tribute to Helene Cooper and everybody's going to really enjoy it. So I just want to plug her at that moment. But anyway, yeah, I mean, so I, I knew it would be a big deal, but I guess n none of us knew how big a deal it would be, really. I mean, it was just stunning what happened after that story came out. The article, I mean, I got back into the UFO topic in a big way after that came out, um, years before I had any stupid ideas like starting a podcast on the subject. Mm -hmm. And I think many people were affected by it. They either had an introduction or a reintroduction back into the world of UFOs. And I wonder, given your knowledge of the community and the reactions from your book and such, were there any frustrations that came up that were unexpected? Was there anything that came off the back of it that would, that disappointed you? Um, you mean with regards to the, to the New York times story or yeah, the, the December 2017 article? Yeah. Was there anything off the back of it that you didn't expect in a negative way? Um, well, I think there was a little confusion about, you know, whether we should have mentioned the, the OSAP program. I mean, there was some pushback about that and there were a whole lot of reasons why we didn't. But no, I would, I mean, I, I, I mean, there's always the debunkers that come out of the woodwork and take the video. I mean, a lot of what made that story so popular was those videos. Mm. So the Fleer and the Gimbal video were released. And I think that was a lot of what drew people to that story. The, you know, the regular person. Um, and there are of course debunkers that tried to debunk the videos, but no, I mean, I, I felt it all as a very positive kind of project uh pro you know progression of things that happened after that you know especially when congress started to get more interested in it and um people were taken into brief people some of the pilots and others were started to brief members of congress i mean that was a huge step forward which hadn't happened before so um no i mean uh, i don't 
I tend to sort of focus on the positive anyway and not dwell on the negative too much. No, that, that's that's good to hear. And the article has <clears> been discussed ad nauseum by many people and I'm sure by yourself. So we won't dwell on it too much. And I've talked about it so many times on the podcast in various different ways. Pe- people know it inside and out. There have been well, follow up. Yeah. yeah. I just want to add that we were under absolute strict control by our editors. I mean, the, the level of of involvement of the editors at the New York Times was really intense. And I mean, we, we, we would have liked to have included some things that we couldn't include because of the editors. And we had to add in, they wanted us to add in, you know, skeptical opinions and this kind of stuff. And they just micromanage the story. So it's a little bit hard when you work really, really hard and you're coming up against that kind of control and then people criticize you for what you've done. You know, it's not like there was one criticism. I remember that um, we didn't talk enough about the UFOs themselves and what the, what the program had actually learned about UFOs. It was all about who funded it and, you know, who, how it was set up and Robert Bigelow got the contract to do this and that. And, and it's like, that was what the times was willing to to publish, you know? Um, So anyway, I just kind of want people to know that there was a really intense level of control and the editors were almost like co-writing it. They weren't really, you know, I mean, when you do a story, you, 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 you sign off as the authors, if if you don't like some edits, if you really want to fight the edits and don't, and, and you you know, then you negotiate with them, but it's not like they can force you to do something, but they mm-hmm. have a lot of power and you have to agree as the writers to accept their edits. But anyway, I just want people to know that there was a lot of control, a lot of editing for the New York times on this story. And it's not, it's not surprising to me that there was given the nature of the subject. No, of course. And I think naturally I've got to ask, you you say there were things you wanted to put in there that you weren't allowed. And are there things that you still can't talk about? Obviously, you won't mention that here. But is there anything now that you could say almost five years or one month away from the five year anniversary of that article that now you could say this was going to go in, but for some reason it didn't? Yeah, I mean, it was really also because of space limitations. You know, there's a certain amount of words that you're allowed to write. And there were certain things that were priorities. And, you know, an example being, um, we, we, you know, we would have, I would have liked to write a little more about what the program had to say about UAP. You know, what did they discover? Uh, what worth, you know, what something about, um, just the characteristics of the objects and, and, uh, the, what did the data show that they had spent five years or more than that studying? Just something along those lines. I mean, I, I can't go into too much detail about it, but, um, you know, and I think we kind of did that with the next story, which was in May of 2019, when we when we focused on the pilot cases. And that mm-hmm. was when Ryan Graves came forward and, you know, he came through in our story in another pilot. We talked about the East Coast sightings off the Roosevelt and I think, and that story got even more hits than the first one. It got more attention. And I think it was because we were talking about the UFOs themselves, the objects, what they looked like and how they behaved and how did the pilots react and how did, you know, what did the pilots do when they encountered them? That kind of thing is really, really fascinating to people. Plus we had, I think we had another video with that story as well which had already come out, but it hadn't come out in the times. And so I, I remember that was, I think it was the 10th or something in the, in the, so every year at the end of the year, the New York times issues, their 100 most read stories of the previous year. And that story I believe was number 10 of all the stories in the New York times for the whole year. It was really, really popular. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, so I'm just making the point that people like to read more about the objects and the mystery of the UFOs than they do about how much the program was funded and who fa- who set it up and all of that. I think there's an element as well of that that first article laid the foundation for for what was to come for many people and to get people back looking at the subject. And, you know, no one visits the hotel when they're building the foundation, but once it's open, they'll come to visit. And I suppose a lot of that was was what that second and subsequent articles has done. There was another 
there were several follow-ups, like you say, after December 2017. And one that really got people talking ahead of time was July 2020, where you, you'll know yourself better than I, the expectation online amongst the UFO community um, was that there was going to be a, a full expose on crash retrieval programs within the US government is essentially what the was being blown up online what came out while fantastic work was not quite as sensationalist as some people had reported would come out um was there a what could have been story there or is what came out the original intended narrative and story um yeah then that buzz online really did not help (laughs) didn't help us at all it's really hard when people do that um for the writers and um but anyway um I, you know, I, I don't feel like I can, I'm not supposed to say a whole lot about our process with the times, but just let's just just to say uh, we certainly had more information than was included in that article. And we had a certain length in which we could work and we had a, an editor that we had to respond to. And that's the best, you know, it's the best we could do at the time, given yeah. all the circumstances we had to deal with um, and I think- and I, how, how it got blown up so much online. I'm sure they were very disappointed when they read the article, (laughs) excuse me, but just to have anything at all about crash retrievals in the New York times is a big accomplishment. Just to have anything to have a quote from Eric Davis saying, and Lou Lou Elizondo talking about it is, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't easy to get what little we did get to get it into that paper. Yeah, so. just to have that phrasing like off-world vehicles in there in any way, shape or form is an achievement, let alone, you know, having the New York Times publish statements like that. I get why some people were disappointed, but that was more of their own doing than anything else. You know, it's like one of the Marvel movies coming out and not quite having the ending you hoped for. But, you know, you never made the movie. You're just there to watch it. Um, and I get why that would be frustrating on the author's end as well, that you're putting in that hard work and effort. And no doubt, given just the very nature of crash retrievals and off-world vehicles, recovered materials, even if you've got some very good sources and you can go to an editor at any paper, let alone the New York Times, and say, look, I want to write this, is there just some things that right now are still too sensational to put into print? Yeah, I mean, I think that the real problem with that is that you don't have they're, they're all classified, right? If, if we have crash materials, they're buried in, in secret access programs and we don't have people on the record giving us any proof that they exist. So that's for a paper like the New York Times, that's what you need. You need corroboration, you need documentation. You don't just put it in because somebody says it, which is really what we did. It was just, you have to rely on the authority of the person making the statement. But even when you have a real authority making the statement, it's very hard to, to not have more, you know? So they, they had to qualify these statements by saying there is no proof that these exist, you know? And, and that's absolutely true. And if, if to whatever, and you know, I mean, I certainly have sources that talk to me off the record, but off the record is off the record. So that's one of the problems with writing about that particular issue is that it's all classified and you can't document it or prove it or say where they are or what they've learned about them or how long they've had them or where they were retrieved or anything, right? Yeah. So people can write blogs and speculate about all of that or have, and also people can use unnamed sources sometimes, like I think Politico does that. We do not do that in the New York Times. We have to get people on the record, which means they give us their names. And we can't write a story based on what three anonymous sources tell us. Even though Julian Bards did that in a recent article for the New York Times, but certainly Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Kane are not going to be able to, we're not doing that. You know, we're, we're not, and we're freelancers. We're not staff. There's a difference. Um, and I, I do want people to know that, you know, we are, uh, Ralph and I are, are freelancers for the Times, which means if we have a story, we pitch it to them. And if they go for it, we contribute a story at that particular time. And then we, we have nothing to do with the Times other than our particular story. So Julian Barnes is, is a full-time staff member. He's a full-time high-level reporter for the New York Times. So he's going to have a, he's, his situation is very different in that he's on the staff. And um, we, Ralph and I, have no influence at all over what anybody else at the Times writes so I just want to make sure people are clear about that, that 
so that they don't mix us up with Julian Barnes. We're, we, we, we have absolutely no relationship with each other and we have nothing to do with what he has nothing to do with, with what we write and we have nothing to do with what he writes. Um, so I just because I, 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 I was told that some people weren't clear about that, that, you know, it, we have nothing to do with the Julian Barnes uh, articles, any of the ones that he's done. And I did notice that they gave, they allowed him to use anonymous sources, but you know we don't do that. And so you know if we could have done that for crash retrievals, maybe we would have been able to print more. But with, with a topic like that, you've got to have names on the record. Well, if I was going to read my next question word for word, that begins Julian Barnes recently wrote an article that many would see as a counterpoint to yours, Leslie. So I'll just expand on that since you, you've mentioned Julian, and I was going to bring him up. Um, Yours, Ralph's, and Helene's work was uh, seemed to really remove some of that stigma from the UFO conversation that's been there for a long time. But for many, I think what they saw as an issue was Julian Barnes' take seemed to be an old-fashioned take on the UFO conversation, rubbishing sightings as airborne clutter, foreign drones and such. And let's be fair, a lot of these sightings in general are just that, which is which is fine. That's to be expected in this topic. Though, like you say, it admits only half the cases being referred to in the upcoming report, of which the rumour is 366, um, are actually identified. If that type of reporting, and I'm someone who at a very base level studied journalism when I was at university for a couple of years, that still comes across as biased reporting. And I wonder, does that surprise you, regardless of Julian Barnes' permanency at the New York Times or not? It's a very highly reputable paper. And I just wonder, given the effort you've gone to and the hoops you've jumped through to get your articles published, like you say, Julian Barnes wades in with a biased article that counters yours and, like you say, unnamed sources there as well. Yeah, so tell me what exactly is the question, because I may or may not be able to answer it. <laughs> no, other. so it, does that sort of biased type of reporting surprise you? Or do you feel this is just the New York Times giving fair time to the other side of the argument when it comes to the ufo topic um that's a really good question and you know i don't i don't think it's a matter of giving time to the other side because we we just reported facts in our stories you know we didn't i don't think our stories were biased i mean no we included skeptical comments in all of them maybe not i don't know yeah we did in all of them and we're just reporting the facts I feel that I, I was surprised by his article. I had no idea it was coming out. I was as surprised as everybody else. Um, and it, you know, it's his perspective. It's his, I mean, it's obvious that the sources he had provided the information that he wrote about. And so he relied on certain sources to do that for him. And I, I have no idea what his bias is or what his, you know, I don't know anything about what went into that story. And, you know, I don't want to comment on it too much, but I was, I was surprised. That's for sure. And yeah. I suspect he'll do another one after this report comes out, if it ever does come out. Uh, I suspect he'll do another story then. He did, an, he did a story following the June 2021 report, um, which, you know, of course, Ralph and I would have loved to have been able to cover that report. And we would have given it a context because we have so much knowledge that some just a staff, you know, that he did, he didn't have the context that we had. I think we could have done a really good job, but they're they're going to put their own people on their stories whenever they can. So he'll cover the, the report and we'll see what that's like. So, uh, yeah, I, I just can't go into it too much no no and I, I, it's not a case of you know warring journalists or people you know going against colleagues and such i would never want that either i just wondered again in broad terms though is there any danger of this signaling the new york times having a change in attitude towards the subject or do you feel again it's it's fair i just don't know i mean um i really don't know i all we can do is find out if ralph and i come up with another story and try to get it published. And we, we just have to see what the future holds. Um, I mean, new, news stories are not supposed to represent any kind of position. Hmm. So I think some people feel that perhaps his story was more like an, an op-ed piece or an opinion piece. Cause every, you know, 
I know I hear you saying that you thought it was biased when you read mm. it. Yep. So the people that feel that way have questioned perhaps this should have, you know, it's more like what they call an opinion piece or an op-ed um, because news stories are not supposed to be like that. They're not. So it, it really shouldn't be that the Times is taking any position on this at all. It should just be we're reporting the facts about this issue. So people have to interpret it however they however they want. Um, and, you know, I did look at the com. There were like 258 comments or something to his article. Uh, and most of them were people in the comments were not happy with the story. So that's I don't know what else to say. Um, well, but, thanks. Um, for, thanks for commenting as much as you could, because yeah. I appreciate it's an awkward position to be put in. Um, I do want to ask, though, just as a last word on your series of articles with Ralph and Helene and, and whether you do any even on your own. It seems like it's been a, almost like a franchise of articles and it's been like the Marvel movies building to something. And I just wonder if your series of articles had now been written and there were no more to come on this topic with the New York Times, would you feel a sense of unfinished business in that respect? I think if we if we can't publish in the New York Times, we will probably try to find another place to publish. I mean, I, Ralph and I feel very dedicated to our partnership as reporters in this. And, you know, uh, we only do certain kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. um, we want to keep the door open at the New York Times. So we're certainly going to keep working there, you know, if we can, if, if it ever becomes clear that we can't for some reason, uh, I don't think we're going to want to stop doing it. We'll just find another, another venue where we can publish. So we do intend to keep doing it, but it's, um, you know, we, we, we only do very important kind of, you know, really groundbreaking types of stories um, where we have people on the record and we have a lot of data to put into the story. So there, and that, that's why we don't do them that often. And sometimes we have a story that the New York Times doesn't want, and then it doesn't, we don't end up doing it. So we just have to take everything as it comes. But uh, we do, we do intend to keep working together. We'll see what happens. Well, I'm sure the New York Times appreciate the clicks that go their way and the, the buys of the papers. If people still buy print, uh, I know that's becoming more and more of an old fashioned thing. But uh, I am subscribed to one newspaper via my Gmail account, and it is the New York Times because of those articles that you were writing with your colleagues. So I'm sure there are many more people like myself that get a whole load of New York Times alerts every single day, but we're just hoping mm -hmm. that one of them pops up saying UFO or UAP in it. Um, so yeah, yeah, thank you again for that work. But listen, you mentioned, Leslie, the report that was due as of the 31st of October that was uh, to be submitted. As we record this, it's the 19th of November and it's still unreleased. So we're coming on three weeks. You had previously heard it was due to be delayed by a few days. You mentioned that on James Iandoli's podcast, Engaging the Phenomenon. Hello to James, I know you'll be listening. Um, <laughs> so any further updates or ideas why we're still waiting? Because at the time with James, you did say it's going to be delayed by a few days, I've heard. And you, you sort of yeah. tail off and you say only a few days and I don't really have any inside scoop on this. I mean, the people I've talked to that know how things work in Washington have told me that it's very it's very common for a report to be delayed like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you can read into it what you want, but there it wasn't like a required deadline. I mean, Congress requested this report. So, and apparently this happens all the time in Congress. Congress will request a report and it's late. So, you know, I don't know why it's why it's late, but there are all kinds of reasons why reports in general are late, you know. So anyway, I'm not I just don't have an inside line to what's going on there into the in, within the agency or anything. Um, I'm sure there are people that know more about it than I do, but I just I don't know what's going on. The issue for them being this one is about UFOs. So straight away, it's got the conspiracy tag on there. So all sorts of rumours start, don't they? Um, but I tend to leave those for other folks to discuss, which is always fair. Rumours are always fun, but... They're just not ready yet. They may just still be working on it. On you that, know? though, I'll just say, personally, my expectations are that we're going to see 366 cases, of which half of them are identified, half of them aren't. But right. outside of that, I would imagine we're not going to see too much in terms of we're not going to see diagrams or pictures. We're not going to see videos attached to it. 
This is something that's been put together by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and a small team over the course of, what, seven months now since he started in that role. And it's, a, again, a baby steps. It's an early report. Uh, you'll remember as well as anyone, Leslie, back when the first report was due to come out, Christopher Mellon, Lou Elizondo and others were on mainstream media citing they need two to three years to put together a fully comprehensive report on this topic and that six to nine months was not enough time. I just right. wonder, what are your expectations for, for this report, if indeed it does come out in the coming days and weeks, that, that we could see as a best case scenario? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty much like what you said. I mean, it might be a little bit better than the first one, but I don't think it's going to be hugely better. Uh, I, I just, I don't think it'll be that different. And just, as you said, maybe more cases, um, but not a lot of data. That's what, it, you know, that's what we're really not getting is mm. data, you know, specifics of some of the cases or, as you said, diagrams, photographs, videos, uh, details about cases. I, I don't think we'll get that. But you know, I suspect it'll go a little bit further than it did before, but I really don't know. I mean, I don't have any more special insight into it, I don't think, than anybody else. Um, and, uh, of course, the classified one is the one that'll be the really important one, and we don't get to see that one. So hopefully the Congress will at least receive something that's more significant than the, what they got before. So, I mean, I think what's most important is what goes to the Congress. And more than, yeah. they're always going to get the good stuff, as people would say. I, I just wonder, though, in terms of an unclassified report, looking down the line, this is funded to 2026, I believe, is the year. What What is the best case scenario, again, you think that with any political knowledge you have, which will, even as small as it may be, will be more than mine, given I'm based in the UK, what could these reports become? Are we going to get to a point we could get videos or or pictures released to the public, or is that still just too much of an ask? I don't know. I mean, maybe that will happen, but not necessarily in the context of the of the reports, because um, we do have the possibility of whistleblowers coming forward in the next year or two, based on this new legislation that gives more greater protections to them. So there might be additional hearings also in in the Senate or in in the house and those venues and through those processes, perhaps videos or photographs would be released. So I don't think it's only the report that we, you know, that we can expect mm. for those kinds of things to happen. I think they, they might happen in other ways. Um, so especially if there are additional hearings, perhaps some of the, some of our representatives will want to bring forward some better videos and photos than we saw at the last hearing because I don't think they were too happy with those. So, no, so we'll that, see. That didn't go well. And they couldn't even work <laughs> VLC media player at the time, from what I remember either. Um, listen, I want to ask, and it's like you're reading the screen, that there was a rumoured immunity for whistleblowers. I've spoken with Jacques Vallée recently, Jim Semivan, Gary Nolan, all discussing these possibilities. Um, and I wonder if, if you had a limited window to interview one potential whistleblower or someone that would speak outside of their NDA restraints. And the New York Times said, you've got to do it tonight. NDAs are lifted, uh, but we need to end the paper by tomorrow. Do you already know who you would go to? Um, I do know some whistleblower of them. I know one and I know of others, but um, the issue is, is whether they want to come forward or not, not whether I want to report on it. And I think they're wise to wait until the process is in place. They need to follow the process that's being set up for them if they want to have the protections that are being offered. It's a very, very sensitive business for these mm. people. And they're taking a great risk because uh, there could be repercussions against them. You know, there are, there are people that do not want this kind of information to come out. So I would, um, you know, I don't think I would ever be in that situation um, unless there was a competing newspaper that was about to do it and we, we had to beat them or something like that. But I would want to see them go through the required procedure before they go to the press um, for their own protection and for their own legitimacy. Yeah. You know, if they bypass that, it just doesn't give them the credibility that they deserve. But more importantly, it doesn't give them the protection that they have to have, that they need to have. So um, I, you know, 
I just want them to take their time and do do what's best for them and, and make sure that they're safe. That's what's important. Yeah, I've mentioned on the podcast as well, speaking to several of the, the names I mentioned and other people, even just taking a, a Lou Elizondo, who's the, the biggest name in this at the moment for the length of time he's been discussing the topic and what his role was. People want Lou just to come out on Fox or NBC or CNN and talk about the UFOs, the crash retrieval programs, where the bodies are and if he had that kind of knowledge. But people forget Lou's got a family, Lou's got children, Lou has a life he wants to live in relative peace and harmony, I'm sure, as well. And all of that goes away, that safety, that protection. It's not just as easy for someone, is it, to come out? And and do you think even if those options and safeties are afforded or promised to these people, we'll still see a reluctance for individuals to come forward? Yeah, I mean, the, the first point is, if for Lou or anybody to talk about that kind of information, they're actually breaking the law, right? This is classified information. So if they do have access to it, they it's not just a risk of threats or whatever. It's that they're in violation of the law. They are They are risking the national security of the United States by talking about classified information. And good patriotic people are not going to do that. You know, for a lot of reasons, I mean, you just can't ask people to do that, to, to, to go to jail and break the law. I mean, they've taken oaths not to do that. I completely respect that. I think what's really special about this procedure that's being put in place is that they're being allowed to release the, the, the NDAs that they've signed are being released. And so they will be able to provide some of this information to, to Congress. Um, but I still think those doing that are still at risk, even though the, the, you know, the oversight is there by Congress, I think they need more, more protection than Congress can provide. And hopefully there will be other areas of government that will provide that. But they still might be at risk, because there are forces out there that can pretty much do what they want if they want to, you know, cause harm to somebody. Um, I think one thing to, to remind people is that the it does exempt this 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 protection, this whistleblower invitation that's sort of being offered to people through this legislation, does it it um it does not include people who want to talk about special access programs and really, really top secret programs that they're sort of exempt from this. So I think anything to, you know, so I don't know. I mean the crash retrieval information is possibly not even covered under this because th those would be in special access programs. So I don't exactly know what kind of information might come through this process given that exemption. Um, uh, but I just think that I, I, I think it takes a lot of courage for people to do it when yeah. they, you know, even though they they're given under the law, this protection, there's always a risk and they can, they can receive, push, you know, blow back at work. They can have big characters can character can be smeared and mm. they can be, um, you know, there's plenty of ways for people who don't like it to take action against them. And, um, they're risking their jobs, you know, they're risking their reputations and their safety. And, um, so we'll see how far the process goes. I mean, I'm hopeful about it, but I also recognize that there are a lot of obstacles to it as well. Yeah. Speaking of obstacles, the Air Force are famously non-communicative when it comes to this topic, um, not particularly helpful uh, in terms of any communication, what they want to come out. And I think of, of anyone, they are one organization that doesn't want this story to come out and would happily see it go away for various reasons. I've heard you mention and others, Leslie, that the Air Force going the involvement in this goes back 50, 60, 70 years or more, and that maybe some people who were involved in those early cover-ups for what, whatever it may have been, sightings, data, retrievals, had the best intentions at the time and thought they were doing the best thing, but serving their country, national security, but ended up doing things that maybe now would be frowned upon if that came out. And I wonder, in your time researching this have you tried to reach out to sources within the air force often and what are those attempts at communication like for you trying to get someone from the air force to talk i don't i have never talked to anybody who is not who is current with the air force 
I just, ha- I don't have any stories. I have, I've talked to retired people from the, people who have retired from the Air Force. But no, I mean, I, 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 you're right that they're just not off. They're not as, as available as people are in the Navy, say. Um, and I, I mean, some people want to hold, I don't know. I think that there should be kind of an immunity granted to anybody who did things in the past that it, it's just such, it's, you know, the, I don't think we should be going after people who did things in the 1960s or seventies or fifties, yeah. you know, that were, that they thought were the right thing to do for a whole lot of reasons at the time. Uh, I just don't think that's productive. And I think if we want the Air Force to cooperate, the best thing we can do is to just let some of that go. But, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm not involved at all with the Air Force. I just don't know uh, that much about their position and how, you know, what kind of, how, who's been reaching out to them and what their relationship is to the current agency, the Arrow. Uh, and I think everyone's hoping for more involvement from them, but I really don't know that much about it. I'm just not involved. Um, But I do not believe in just sort of going after them for things that happened decades ago. I don't think that's a good idea. And I think it'll, it could slow down the process. If we want the air force to cooperate, you know, going after them and trying to punish them is not going to help them come forward and help them be part of a positive process by which more and more is revealed and, and by which they are going to cooperate with other agencies. It's just not, it slows the process down and maybe even stops it because if they, if they feel that that's in their future, they're not going to be supportive of any kind of process of, of, of greater transparency. They're going to feel they have to protect themselves. So it's, it's a, it's a tricky situation on that level. I think that's a good place, Leslie, to move on to us, the, the second part of the show, to be honest, because we've covered a lot of ground there and it's all tied in quite nicely together. So thank you very much. In the second part, I, I do want to move a little bit into your work on life after death and how that ties in with the UFO topic and then some listener questions as well, of course, including the um, inquiry into anomalous experiences and the phenomenon conference. Every time I say that, I just wish James and Jay had settled for a slightly shorter, <laughs> shorter title because I always forget it and have to read it. So thank you, gents, for that. Um, maybe they're working with Arrow and such for coming up with these acronyms that the, the US government are coming out with. Um, yeah. Listen, you've done some great work, as I mentioned at the beginning, on other areas of the paranormal, specifically the idea of life after death. Your book was a huge success and was then the inspiration behind a very well-received six-part Netflix series. Um, People who have died and come back report seeing beings or others when they're crossing over to whatever is beyond this life. And and I wonder, do you see many crossovers in your work on the afterlife and UFOs coming together? I mean, I'm just beginning to get more of a handle on that, Andy. You know, when I wrote the book Surviving Death, which was... I started in around 2013, I think, actually writing it. came out in 2017. Um, I really thought of it as a subject completely separate from UFOs. You know, I didn't, I just didn't see the connection, I mean, in any big way, because I'd always focus on UFOs as physical objects. And mm-hmm. I looked, you know, from the military's perspective, right, and pilots, physical objects that you can see on radar, you know. And, of course, and then I did this other book about, different um, research that's been done on the possibility of the survival of consciousness past death. And it just seemed to me to be completely unrelated. But as I've learned more and more, and I, and I'm, I'm way behind many others who have been thinking about these things for a long time, you know, I'm just much more aware of the paranormal kind of high strangeness elements of the UFO phenomenon, which really don't feature into the reporting that I do because that it's just not the right time. And, you know, we don't, we don't do that yet. They're not ready for that. But um, I think that's partly why I haven't been, you know, as focused on it myself because of just the, 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 the work I do just doesn't include that. But, um, you know, I'm much more aware of it now. I'm, I'm more aware of the links between consciousness and the, the UFO phenomenon and the impact that it has on people's consciousness if they do have a, an encounter, say. Um, and then how that connects with a, a lot of psi phenomena and psi abilities and all of that connects with the question of, of consciousness and what is it and 
is does it go beyond the physical body? And it's all just sort of becomes this universe of mystery and questioning, you know. I can't say I have answers, but I, I definitely think there there is a connection. Um, and, you know, I think people like Jacques Vallée have been exploring that, but mm. Whitley Strieber is another one who has been exploring that for a long time. Um, and, you know, there he talks about cases of, and there of people who ha- will go on a, have a abduction experience or some kind of close encounter experience and they will see a, a dead person in that, during that experience that involves a UFO event. They'll see a lost loved one, you know, just like you might see on a near death experience. So, I'm, I, there, there are obviously a lot of links and I'm not an expert on it. I ha, I'm just, that's something I'm really interested in, in developing and learning more about is that, that connection. And I think um, there are a lot of people exploring that connection now. There so, are just yeah. by, just by lucky chance. I had Whitley Strieber, uh, Jacques Vallée and Jim Semivan all guests back to back throughout October. Um, wow. Not because I planned it that way. It just happened to be the, the way the chips fell, which was wonderful. And you're right. They all share similar stories or, or theories or hypotheses around that, that consciousness or whatever that is to people. Cause it's different things to different people. And I wonder in those early conversations you had with, with sources on or off the record, were there ever those chats about, you know, when you're talking about UFOs, did those kinds of ideas come into the conversations or is that something that maybe came much later or more recently or if at all? I think for me, I mean, there were certainly, we certainly have discussed like close encounter experiences where people and experiences over the years where people's consciousness is affected, where things happen to them as a result of an encounter, you know, but, um, not so much beyond that. I mean, not so much a link to after death experience or near death experience, or it was more just a link to consciousness um, and the impact that a close encounter can have on a person's mind and, and brain. And, you know, and now we have Gary Nolan, who's actually studying the physical parts of the brain, you know, to see what happens in the brain with ex- people who have experiences and are very high functioning people. And a lot of these people are extremely sensitive and have all kinds of psychic abilities. So, um, but so it would come up sometimes in conversations I would have with, with people over the years, but, um, and certainly I, I have learned a lot about close encounter cases or I sort of hate the word abduction, but that's sort of what they've been called. I was very good friends with Bud Hopkins and I learned a lot about the cases he studied. So Mm. I've always been fascinated by it, but I haven't really made the leap until fairly recently of connecting that to anything to do with a a kind of an afterlife realm. I I think we're talking about some dimension of reality that bleeds between the two, you know, A, a very simplistic way of looking at it, but some kind of other dimension that we we really can't perceive with our normal senses, but sometimes we get a glimpse of it or something happens to take us there and then it, it can have a permanent effect. Um, and we don't know, maybe it's, just, it's something right around us all the time that we're just not equipped biologically to perceive. I mean, there's just, I'm just aware of how much we don't know mm. about reality, you know, um, so the more, yeah, it really is true. I know it's a cliche, but it's really true that the more you learn, the more questions there are. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> just just in two years doing this podcast, I've changed my mind. And I think it's always important to have a fluid opinion on these kinds of topics. I wonder, in your research, like you say, with the life after death being relatively new, UFO has been a lot longer for you. If you could, if you had to bet or put money or wager on definitive proof of an afterlife or definitive proof of a non-human intelligence intelligence visiting the earth what would be first the latter definitely i think we've already pretty much got the non-human intelligence proof you know um it's much easier to nail that down than it is to nail down survival past death i mean there's a lot of very provocative and suggestive evidence Mm -hmm. um things that are very hard to explain in any other way, but it's not like you have this solid object that you can document like you can with a UFO, right? Yeah. 
it's just and have have military militaries that collect case data and government agencies and you know 70 years of of re investigation and classified programs you just don't have all that you just basically have some very very high level investigators but not nearly as many and you have people who have had experiences that they can talk about and you can look at the the similarities between a lot of different experiences that people have so it's much harder to, and that's one reason why I found this book much more difficult to write than UFOs, way more difficult because the material itself is not as easy to, you know, to, to just nail down. It's, it's more nebulous. It's, it's more, um, you know, take, it, it involves your imagination and ex personal experience. And um, it's just, as a journalist, it's just not as journalistic, you know, even though I tried to write a book that was as journalistic as it could possibly be on this particular subject. And there is a lot of great research that's been done. So the book kind of includes the research and the personal stories, mm. but it's, it, I don't, I just can't imagine we're going to have proof probably ever really hardcore proof Although some people have had enough experience to think that we do, that they have proof, that they do have proof. Yep. You know, it's very subjective. I mean, if you have a certain level of experience and you have a near death experience, you're absolutely convinced that you have proof. But it's not something that you can prove to anyone but yourself. That's that's the thing. There sometimes seems to be that overlap in, in the two. I know, like Chris, Christopher Bledsoe had a near-death experience when he was much younger, which afterwards opened up what would appear to be a whole range of, of otherworldly phenomena throughout the rest of his life. Whitley Strieber and others have an experience, and I wonder, does this, do these original experiences or initial experiences crack open a door which never quite closes? And you sort mentioned that other dimension, yeah, that it's just there, and you've always then got that little bit of an exposure to it that just now and again bleeds through to a more... A more solid experience it just seemed that way i mean it's a it's a great question you probably know the answer as well as i do you know it does seem that and that's what we were saying earlier about consciousness being affected so he has a near-death experience and then it opens up all these portals of doors in his consciousness to all kinds of other things that happen throughout his life and some of that i think involves ufo type experiences mm. i mean and ufo experiences and that also can be the definition of what they are i feel like has become much broader now that we're thinking of uap right yep we're not thinking of just some physical object in the sky but we're thinking of a much broader range of experience like if you think about the orbs that are documented in the pe pentagon um the, the skinwalkers book skinwalkers at the pentagon i think it's called yep uh, the yep. more recent one. yeah i mean you know these cases of orbs i mean it's not like when I was working on my book in 2010 that I would have considered a, a baseball sized orb as really being a UFO, you mm -hmm. know, it was something else. And now it's like, it's all kind of in one universe, all the, you know, unidentified aerial phenomena it means a broad range of phenomena and you can't necessarily pigeonhole it into any one type of thing. And I think part of that whole mix is, situations like you described where somebody has a near-death experience and then they have all these abilities they didn't have before and then they start have you having ufo encounters and they have this other thing and that other thing happens it's like the broad range of anomalous experiences that people have are all connected and one of the people that's really core in, in writing about that and talking about that is jeffrey kripal from mm. rice university who would be another great interview for you and he and will a, and a couple of weeks hopefully yeah yeah, he's coming to the conference on December 3rd, and he, he's just so brilliant at uh, tying together all the anomalous, what we call anomalous experiences that people have all the time, all different types of experiences that need to be recognized as really part of who we are as human beings. And you know, we've just kind of been in denial about them, but really they're, they're a natural part of who we are. And whether that be UFOs or near death or having precognitive dreams or near death experiences or whatever, you know, it's a matter of just sort of seeing the human being in a different way than we have in the past. And that's how Jeffrey Kripal looks at it. And he also looks at it. He also is very, it's just, he's a religious scholar. So he can go back through history and see 
how these experiences have been reported throughout history, and maybe they're just reworded a little bit because of the time that they have occurred, but you can sort of see this consistency that these been, things have been happening to people forever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a matter of seeing, I, I, so I feel like I used to just see UFOs as where there's this extraterrestrial hypothesis that maybe these craft are coming from somewhere else, mm -hmm. someplace and else in the, in, you know, in our solar system or something. So simplistic. That's what they concluded in the Cometa report. You know, that's what the, a lot of the people concluded in my book in 2010. But now I think we've just expanded our whole perception of what it means to have a UFO encounter. And um, I don't think that that's, I think it's going to take a while before that becomes integrated into places like Congress and, you know, the agency that studies this in the Department of Defense and things like that. But it is a big part of it. And it's the, es it's really the essential element of what the, what it's all about. And I think over time, it's just going to become more and more, it's got to become more integrated into how we see it. It just takes time for it's, us to get there. It's very strange to think that extraterrestrial for many of us would now be a bit of a mundane, you know, ah, they're, they're just coming from somewhere else, not some when else or some other dimension. No. Ah, okay. I suppose that's interesting, you know, but we'll, we'll get to it's that. Rest, right? We yeah, progressed. that's it. Yeah. Um, but that's what this topic does to you. Um, you. You've mentioned a few times the conference. And I want to get to that before we, we mention some listener questions. So an inquiry into anomalous experiences and the phenomenon as an intimate conference series continuing in the heart of New York City, Saturday, December 3rd, 2022. So in a couple of weeks time, uh, James Iandoli and J. Christopher King were both on the podcast a few weeks ago talking about the last conference that was a big smash hit. Um, tickets are sold out for in person for this upcoming coming conference but there are still live stream tickets available and they should also have the technology to take listener questions from the live stream as well so you can be interactive with it or watch it on the repeat um the the lineup is phenomenal again so it's hosted by james iandoli and j christopher king they'll be coming back on next week to chat about it kelly chase from the ufo rabbit hole podcast is a host and priscilla stone from quantum witch cafe as well all fantastic lovely people uh christopher mellon is is you know a very surprising addition given christopher mellon doesn't give too much of his time uh, even to the big mainstream organizations for interviews so it's fantastic that he's going to be there leslie you are also there we've discussed um i believe are you interviewing christopher mellon is that your role within the the conference well i i'm gonna have my own time where i uh do my own thing and then uh yes he is is that is that something that's been announced already yes that's about, be, that's that's yeah. been online yeah Okay, so he has asked me to kind of do a dialogue with him. That's just how he wanted to structure his time. Um, he's very comfortable with that. And so it'll be like a Q&A that I'll, I'll interact with him for about half. And then there'll be a lot of time for audience questions. I think one of the things that's going to be different about this conference from the last one is there's going to be a lot more time for questions from the audience. And as you said, that includes the live stream people. So. Yeah. Um, I certainly intend for my time to allow, just sit back and talk to the audience and have a and a and a dialogue and people can ask me questions that I won't be able to answer, but yeah. I'll do my <laughs> Well, the, the link's in the description for people to buy tickets for that live stream, but all, including uh, Christopher Mellon and Leslie Keane, you have got Jeffrey Kripal, Ralph Blumenthal, Sharon Hewitt Rollett and Whitley Strieber all there as well. So that's an incredible lineup. There is something for everyone, but with the idea that we've talked about, you know, UFOs, afterlife, experiencers, all of that potentially being connected. And I think you've got a wonderful range of people there and experiences themselves um, to have that kind of overall conversation. What, what are you most looking forward to, Leslie, about attending and being part of this conference? Oh, that's a hard thing to say. I mean, I'm I'm really looking forward to all of it. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it all interconnects. Because as you said, we've got people all the way from Whitley Strieber to Chris Mellon, right? I mean, opposite ends of the spectrum, but yet there's a connection too. And um, I just want to see how it all fits together and how people respond to the uh, presentations. And um, I just look forward to interacting with everybody. Uh, and... Yeah, I just think the speakers, every one of them is going to be making an amazing presentation. I mean, um, I'm leaving myself out of that, but everybody else. 
um, you know, and um, yeah. So I'm just looking forward to the whole thing. And I, yeah, I think the um, I, the in-person conference is sold out, but there is a waiting list. So if somebody really wants to come in person, I, mm. I would encourage them to get on that list because there may be people that will cancel. They can't come for some reason, or there may be a few extra tickets at the end that they'll have, you know, they will be able to fit people in. So just don't give up on that if, if you are interested in it. Yeah. I think one of the listeners got in touch with me a couple of weeks ago when it was sold out and he wanted to travel from LA to go. And I think he's got himself a ticket sorted out. So, you know, that's, that's commitment. Um, and I know Graham Rendell and. Okay. Too. There yeah. Well, people coming from Graham Rendell and Dan Zetterstrom, uh, both of this parish and their own their own stuff as well. Um, they're both travelling over, so they'll be looking to say hello to you as well, Leslie, I'm sure. Um, and a few other yeah. listeners too. And Jay, uh, Project Unity is coming. And yes. there were people at that conference from all over the United States, and people from Chicago, I remember, and yeah, California. I mean, and I think this time even more. So it's just going to be, a, there's going to be a great energy in that room. Really, really, people that really want to be there and it'll be very interactive, the whole thing. So I think it's good that it's not a huge audience because it, yeah. it, it's a more intimate experience for everybody there. Yeah. So, and I, I just take my hat off to Jay and James. They're doing such a great job of organizing these events and they're going to keep doing it. We've already working on another one that's going to be in this, you know, coming up in a few months. So, and I'm, I'm really happy to be able to help them with all of it. And I just think they're doing a great job. So, well, yeah, I told, I I told they're them. They're I told them last time, Leslie, if they gave me a few months more notice, I could have attended. So if we're if we're looking at March, April, that would be fantastic. And maybe I could get myself over for one as well. So um, I hope you can, Andy. Yeah, we're looking at April now. I mean, I, I don't I should leave it up to them, but we're looking at early April for the next one. My wife might be a bit more understanding being left with three young children for me to travel <laughs> over to New York for work reasons, obviously. Yeah, I wouldn't enjoy Where myself. Yeah, it all on your taxes, right? Uh, yeah, it'd be horrendous, I'm sure. Yeah, tax deductible, I'm sure. Um, but listen, let's get to some listener questions in the last of the time that we have, Leslie. Um, thanks to everyone who sent over something. And if you're not, uh, you don't have your question read out here, hopefully something's been mentioned in the body of the interview because Leslie's been been great with her time. Um, first up from Newman. Newman asks, where does Leslie see the disclosure debate outside of the US? Could a potential adversary such as China or Russia have incentives and capabilities to scoop the US by taking the lead in the conversation? Yeah, what a great question. I mean, it's something I think about. I, I can't say that I know the answer to that question. Um, and I would I would assume that we at the United States would not want that to happen because we don't want one of our adversaries to take control of the narrative and kind of take the lead on this. We also, of course, don't want them to have the technology if they, you know, there's, that's why one reason why we keep it secret because we don't want our enemies to develop this technology ahead of us. So it's something, it's a really interesting question. You know, what if one of those other countries just announced? Uh, but I just don't, somehow I don't think anyone really wants to announce it, but I, I really can't offer any insight. I mean, it's a fascinating question that is on a lot of people's minds, I'm sure. And I, I just, I don't know how it's going to play out, but it's always a possibility if something like that could happen. I can't rule it out. Another follow-up from Newman, he asks, bear in mind we talked about uh, Julian Barnes' article and how it was opposite sides of the spectrum from your own work with, with Ralph and Helene. Um, what's your stance on the more sensational reporting occasionally that has occurred over the last couple of years? For example, he gives Ross Coulthard's alien metal balls weighing 10 pounds and it coming across potentially as more ancient aliens is his wording the way it's that's kind of set up. Do you think those kind of takes on the UFO subject do more harm than good or are they good for raising awareness? I think they're great. I mean, I think the work that Ross does is absolutely wonderful. And I think the the sphere that he's talking about, the one he presented on his, his documentary, yes, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, there are, there are more, <clears throat> excuse me. There are more spheres than that one. Yep. It's the real thing. And there are people looking into that and studying it. And uh, I think that Ross Coulthard is a fantastic reporter and I would never, you know, I mean, it, the difference is that he he has more leeway than than I do writing for the New York Times. Right. If he does a, a show on Channel 7 in Australia, he has a lot more leeway to to present certain topics 
uh, that that I can't do in the New York Times, you know. And he, so in a way, I kind of envy the freedom that he has to explore some of these other things that may not be a hundred percent documented or maybe a little more, you know, uncertain, but are absolutely fascinating. So I think there's absolutely, we need that kind of reporting. I mean, I, I feel like because I'm sort of keeping myself with the hopes of contributing more to the New York times, I, it limits what I can do greatly. So I think that, so I have no issues with, I think Ross and, and Bryce both do a great job. I have great respect for them. Yeah, I was going to mention Bryce in there as well. Bryce Zabel, who obviously is Ross's uh, partner on Need to Know, their, their show and podcast and works with them in those documentaries as well. Um, next question from David. Through your channels and various contacts, are you aware of any members of Congress who have been politically pressured or otherwise dissuaded from pursuing the kind of soft disclosure we are watching unravel now? I can't say specifically, but I, I know that there are there's a lot of conflict about it. I mean, there are some that don't want it to happen. Um, and I know that um, uh, Senator Burchett, Tim Burchett from Tennessee, mm -hmm. Congressman, I'm sorry, Representative yeah. from Tennessee, just recently said, I think it was in the interview with Jay Project Unity that, um, and he said these things before that he feels like the members of Congress are, he used the word compromised in terms of their ability to, really carry this through. And uh, he didn't go into much detail about what he meant, but obviously there are things going on behind the scenes that there are, I'm sure there are attempts to hold back this process. And, uh, you know, I can't talk about any specific events, but it's, it's not like it's a slam dunk that this is all going to, we're going to get these whistleblowers and it's all going to happen. And we're going to be given all this great information. And, you know, it's, 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 uh, so I, I, I think it's way more complicated and I'm sure there's a lot of pushback against members of Congress that are leading the charge here. Absolutely. I, I get the feeling that some people expect it to be two steps forward, one step back, but I think we could still see three steps, three steps back, one to the side, two steps forward. Yeah, it could be a, a bit of a, a merry-go-round, but it's, it's like, it's going to be interesting along the way. Um, very, very. Question from yeah. Gre Gregory asks: Has there ever been any reports you have heard of, Leslie, of a UFO saving or rescuing a person, someone lost at sea or injured in a remote location? You mean actually picking them up in a craft and taking them to safety? Yeah, I'm. I'm guessing that's what they're going with here. Yeah, they don't say that yeah. specifically, but I can't say. But that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know experiencers who have reported stories like that. I mean, I, 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 there could be the ones that I haven't read, you know, I can't think of any that I'm familiar with of somebody being actually rescued. Um, so, but I'm not aware of every single case that's out there. Do you know, it made, so, me, it made me think of the very first person interviewed on surviving death on Netflix is the canoeist who was stuck upside down and basically for 15 minutes underwater and she yeah. certainly could have used something like that at the time because that was an incredible story. Like that was, yeah, horrible to, to think, yeah, just be drowning and being underwater. But, well, yeah. But anyway, yeah. So, yeah, no reports of that. Which, But thanks for the question, Gregory. A question from Keith. And this one might be a little bit more controversial for some, um, but it's I understand the, the, the question. Um, he says, now the dust has settled, some people question the details of the original 2017 article and the claims specifically of Luis Elizondo, um, claiming that ATIP was more of a hobby and OSAP was the real programme, and this somehow delegitimises Luis Elizondo. Can you weigh in on your opinion of Luis, his claims and the reasons for any of those discrepancies? I mean, I, as we wrote, and we stand by our reporting in that first article, and I stand by Lou. I think I have no, I have absolute proof, documentation and reports of people from the program that Lou Elizondo did head up the ATIP program. Yep. <clears throat> it was a small program, but it existed, you know, at the time he, he resigned, it was in play. And it, um, and I, I do not, 
you know, I, I stand by Lou. I, I trust Lou and I, I think he's done an, he's made an amazing contribution by coming forward and doing all that he has done for all of us. And I'm not interested in focusing on, you know, these criticisms of him. I don't think I'm just, I don't support it. Yeah. I think what some people get at, and I've said on the podcast before, like uh, John Greenwald, I interviewed a few months ago. I I said, I get why people pick up on discrepancies, but it seems to me like if I go to a a football match and I'm I'm recalling the details of being at the match and I say I was wearing a brown t-shirt, actually I was wearing a white t-shirt. It doesn't mean I wasn't at the football game. There's just been a small detail misremembered and people can jump all over those kinds of things, especially in the UFO conversation around dates and what officially when a program started, when a program officially ended, because those are details that we really are privy to anyway, let alone getting the exact details on them. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just think it's I don't go on the I'm not in the Twitter world, so I don't. I'm not privy to all Lucky the kind you. of stuff yeah. that goes on. I just I completely stay away from it. But I, I just don't understand why the hyper focus on detail like that to, to be critical of somebody who's made such a huge contribution. I mean, I don't, I'm just, it, that's not how I want to spend my time is trying to understand what's going on there. Yeah. I just stay away from it. Do you know what? There's, um, there's a lot of good people. There's a lot of good people on Twitter, but I can see also why it's driven away people like Lou from the platform because it just, and he always said, question them, you know, question the data, question everything around this because that's what you should do. But like you say, I think the hypercritical nature of some some things just got too much for people and I don't blame him for, for going away as he did. Um, so yeah, that, that was unfortunate. And people don't, I think, appreciate what they've got until it's gone. It is very much the, the case of what's happened with a lot of these people leaving the platform as well. Um, a question from Beckier, back on the, the subject of the afterlife. What does Leslie think happens when we die? Reincarnation, heaven or hell? Something to that effect. Oh, wow. That's, that's a huge question. I think yeah. That is a big one, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean... You know, the way I, I mean, in my book, I explored so many different areas of, of evidence for survival. And um, I mean, my conclusion really was that it, it does seem that there, there, the consciousness in some form or other does survive, at least for some time. Uh, but, I, you know, I have no idea about heaven or hell. Those seem like religious concepts to me. And my, my research has nothing to do with religion. Uh, I just, you know... Um, and reincarnation, there's there's incredible evidence for. Re- I mean, in fact, to me, that's some of the more the strongest evidence for survival are these cases of young children who re- accurately remember a past life when they're just like three years old, and these the 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 details that they recall can actually be verified to a specific person. That you know, I mean, some of those cases are so extraordinary that to me they're among the more convincing cases of of survival now. Then the question becomes, does everybody reincarnate and how, you know, I, I have no idea. I mean, I don't think anyone really knows the bigger questions about how all of this works. And it does sort of get into religious frameworks and people develop their own frameworks for how they're going to relate to this. But what I was trying to do in my book was sort of look at research, you know, evidence that that's separate from any kind of religion or belief system, really. and it, and I think it's there. I think that it's, there's really solid material that suggests that co- certainly that consciousness functions independently of the body. I believe that there's pretty much proof of that. And this is, of course, the living body, that consciousness, consciousness functions out independently of the brain, which the materialist world would not accept. They believe that the brain generates consciousness. So when there's no brain, there's no consciousness. But we have Many, many, many examples and study that shows that studies that show that that's not the case. So, but we, you know, so therefore that sort of establishes a strong possibility that if if it can function without the brain when the person is still living, and although, I mean, it functions, the person dies, right, and the, the the consciousness is still happening. It's still got memories. It's still experiencing things when there is absolutely no brain, and the person is basically dead temporarily. The, diff- the thing is they come back. So the question is, does the same thing happen when, when the person is dead and they don't come back? 
You know, is this, this consciousness exists independently of the brain the same way it does in these other experiences where they eventually do come back, even though they are really dead for a while. So you think it probably does happen the same way, but you, you can't prove it because the person doesn't come back to tell us mm. about it, right? Um, I hope that makes sense. So, you know, that's sort of the level at which I'm looking at it. And it's not about, you know, it's not like I have any particular insight into how all of it works or whether there's heaven or hell or how reincarnation works. I can just present you with case data that illustrate that these things actually happen. And um, yeah, so I hope that the questioner might, you know, look at some of that data and then maybe she or he will formulate their own framework because I think that's ultimately what we have to do. And like what's evidence to one person may not be evidence to another. And what's really can, you know, a person can be really convinced by something that might not convince someone else. So I think when it comes to the evidence for survival of consciousness, it's a very personal kind of thing that it, it connects very much with one's own personal experience and also what one considers to be valid evidence and, and versus not, you know, yeah, it's not as hardcore as other areas of investigation. So I would just encourage the person who asked it with that great question to look at some of these, you know, sort of objective uh, studies that really show these things really do happen and then formulate your your framework depending on your own worldview, you know, once you've done that. I mean, I just think that's that's the only thing you can do, but I have no particular wisdom in heaven into heaven or hell or anything like that. Well, <laughs> well, I've got two questions left from listeners and one of them follows on from that exact question actually. Um, Tree of Life says, in surviving death, Leslie describes scenarios where children seem to recall past lives, which you've just mentioned. What is Leslie's take on the theory that they might instead be channeling a spirit? So rather than reincarnation, it's more, it's like a kind of spiritual possession that results in the children's experiences of a past life. Yeah, I mean, that's it's an absolutely great question. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think I'm relying partly on the work of Ian Stevenson and Jim Tucker, who at the University of Virginia, the Department of Perceptual Studies or Division of Perceptual Studies, who have, you know, they're MDs, they're trained, and, and Jim Tucker is a psychiatrist. And so I think, you know, he knows what the characteristics of possession look like. I mean, there are cases where a, a, a person appears to be possessed by something and also um, multiple personality disorder, that kind of thing. I mean, there are ways of evaluating whether that's happening to somebody. So I think there's that level of it. But when you have a three-year-old describing memories, I mean, it doesn't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I just, the, the way it happens is it's for one thing, it's not continuous so when I think of possession, I don't know, it's like there's some spirit entering the body of the child. The child is always present. The child has memories and then for maybe for months and months and months has no memories. It's just a normal kid, you know, and then something will trigger a memory or they'll have a nightmare. Nightmares are very common where they relive the, the previous death. So um, the child very much feels that they were that person. That's how they experience it. Um, they were that person. Now, but, you know, there's probably no way to absolutely prove that it's not some kind of spirit that's coming, interacting with that child and they're absorbing it. It could be, you know, it just, I don't know, if you look at the, a lot of the case reports and read a lot of the case studies, it just, it doesn't leave you with that impression. That's all I can say, but I'm not an expert on it. And I also trust the authorities who do look at these cases and have, don't really come up with that as an explanation. That's a fair That's answer. Like That's a fair answer, and I would probably go along with that as well, with my, with my limited knowledge, because some of the 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 cases I've heard of of these children recalling past lives are just incredible. And we've always said my little boy has kind of been here before, and um, the way he goes on and just six years old, but a kind of old spirit. Whereas my my little girl and other little boy are probably much newer, you know, not quite as bright. Um. So, and fi <laughs> final question from Joe. Joe asks, what has surprised you most about the UFO topic that you've learned in the last five years that maybe doesn't get the coverage or discussion within the UFO community that it should? Well, because I'm not always aware of what's getting discussion in the UFO community because I'm I'm just not that involved. Um. So, 
uh, what is the most, what is the, he said the most unusual, less, uh, most unexpected The most interesting thing? or surprising thing, you know, yeah. I, th I think he's looking for maybe a little bit of a nugget of, you know, Leslie's heard this, but it's never really came out. But I wish I had something I could offer. Um, I think, you know, for me personally, it's, I think the getting an expanded perception of what the UFO is all about. Like, for instance, the book that I mentioned, Skinwalkers of the Pentagon, which kind of, ex you know, the, these bizarre experiences, the whole hitchhiker effect thing where the paranormal aspects are, are go with a person to another location and, and the orbs that are coming into people's bodies and causing medical injuries. Yeah. Um, I think I'm more aware of this as being something that I'm that's fearful, I think. I'm more aware that this is a power, you know, this non-human intelligence is something that has complete control over us humans. That's, that's, and that I understand why they've wanted to keep that secret. Really. Um, I, I, I have more of a sense of the frightening elements of it. I have to say than I had before 2017, just from talking to people and, um, you know, people who've had experiences and close encounters. And I know that uh, listening to Jim Semivan and what happened to him and his perception of this, I really relate to that. Um, so I'm a little more sort of less in awe of it and a, less awe and a little more fear to tell you the truth. Uh, yeah. And just an expanded perception of how much we really don't know about what it is and how it manifests in so many different ways. Like how do we explain the variety of manifestations of whatever this paranormal, this, this other reality is. But I think that the element of the non-human, what, whatever this non-human thing is that it does have so much power and control over us. It can do anything it wants and we have nothing we can do about it. And that's really sort of sunk in, hit me at a new level in more recent times. Not that that's something wonderful to to share, but uh, it's, I think it's the reality of it. And um, it's just, you know, hearing also things like just weird illnesses that people get from it, you know, and you don't want to get too close to these things and all of that. Um, I just wasn't as aware of it before. But, um, yeah, I think... Uh, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I've certainly gotten to know more people who I'm speaking to off the record, behind the scenes. I'm much more aware of how much n there is knowledge, you know, among deep, you know, highly classified and pe people with clearances within mm. the intelligence community. There really is a lot of knowledge about this. And um, I think there are a lot of discussions about what should be revealed and what shouldn't be revealed. And I understand the hesitancy about revealing certain things because it's a lot to deal with. And um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I do worry about it a little bit more. I, I'm also worried about the future more. I worry about the climate change and how that might interact with the UFO phenomenon, you know, as the, as the earth starts to, become less and less inhabitable. Uh, how is that all going to play out? So anyway, I don't know. I'm just rambling. Well, <laughs> I'm just rambling. That's, a, that's a good answer. I, I ramble to end on. Uh, Leslie, listen, thank you very much for your time. Just before you go, um, is there anything you're working on just now that you want to let the listeners know of? Obviously, you'll be appearing at the, the conference on December 3rd. Anything else that you've got in the, in the pipe works? Well, I have just finished working on this um, five-part series, which was um, for CNN about UAP. Mm -hmm. So I've got some news about that, and I'm going to talk about that at the conference. So that's been a, a really big part of my of my work in the last two years, I would say. And um, I'm always working on trying to find new stories and keeping abreast of everything and talking to a lot of people. And uh, a lot goes on behind the scenes so it might look like i'm not doing much but i am doing a lot it just doesn't always get brought forward you know so um there'll be more in the future 
Well, like yeah. you say, you're not on Twitter, but you're more active on Facebook. People can follow your Facebook page if they're that way inclined. Uh, your website and all descriptions for your books and such will be in the links to the show as well, Leslie. So thank you very much for spending so much time with me. It's been wonderful to speak to you, and this has been two years in the making for me. So thanks very much. Well, well that's great. And I'm so glad I could come on with you, Andy. It's been delightful to talk to you. Thank you for your, your good questions and, and all the best that is all for this week's show thank you very much for listening please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform you can like retweet and subscribe that would all be very much appreciated the shows are being uploaded onto youtube as we speak more and more you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that ufo podcast to access the shows ad free as well please get in touch on twitter facebook instagram that ufo podcast of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shut out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little rat. Meditative game of state full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. And I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was wet. And I called up my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toys. They thought it was my problems. And they think I should take care of me. And I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me. Thank you.